welcome back. And for those of you who are new with our program today, Hollywood Structured, welcome. It is a program that concerns itself with the inner workings of Hollywood and is trying to guide and help the young newcomer arriving in this town and trying to break into show business. In the preceding shows, we have spoken about the necessity to have a car because of the enormous distances between studios. We have spoken of the necessity of having money, advanced money, for rent, for pictures, for resume, uh, of having a job in order to have money in your pocket and making new friends. To join a good workshop or a theatrical group to learn, to develop yourself some more, and also to make good friends. Today I want to speak about three Hollywood publications which are considered the Bibles of Hollywood. Dan Lal, The Liberality, and The Hollywood Reporter. Now, there are many other publications, but only these three should concern you now because they will give you all the information that you will need as to who is shooting what and where and when and who is casting what and where and when. Um, Daily Variety and The Hollywood Reporter have a similar format. They deal mainly with union jobs. Drama Log, on the other hand, has many ads that deal with non-union film casting, non-union crew casting, non-union theatrical casting, and student film, non-union casting from USC or UCLA. Uh, Dramalog, being a wise paper and accepting many ads, has in its paper a little disclaimer that say that they are not responsible for the ads placed in their newspapers. Therefore, it is up to you to check either with your drama coach or with your friends who already have been in this town for a while. Now, there is nothing wrong with you working non-union to start with to get the feeling of what it will be like later. Now, if you do belong to the union, Screen Actors Guild, um, SAG for short, or the American Federation of Radio and TV Artists, AFTRA for short, you can no longer work non-union. Or you might lose your union card, or you might be fined, or both, for at least a year. <clears throat> Let me see now. During the course of the year, according to how busy we are, the casting sheet could look like this, full. Or like this, a little shorter. Or during the period that we call hiatus, just about that much. There is practically nothing shooting in town except, that, except possibly the five soap operas that are shooting. The hiatus period is usually April, May, or June when the networks have not decided which shows have to be canceled, which shows will be, back, will be brought back to the air, and during the time in which they are trying new shows. All right. After we visit with our guest, we shall talk about job opportunities in the film industry. Now, let's welcome director-actress Linda Gray. Hello, Lillian. Well, we're finally working together, aren't we? Finally. <laughs> <laughs> I've waited a long time for this. <laughs> All right. As you know, uh, our program, Hollywood Structured, is geared toward the young people mm -hmm. who are arriving here expecting miracle overnight, not being too well prepared. And we are introducing 
to them people who either didn't start as being actors and who then became actor and are segueing into some profession and I thought you would be a perfect example since you Thank did you. not start as an actress. That's true. Please share your thoughts with us. Uh, How did you start? Well, there, you know, there's several thoughts uh, and again it's a pleasure to be here to share uh, because I have two children also who are segueing into the acting profession and um, so they know my story and it's a story that I'd love to share because they've heard it so many times and they're they're learning by my knowledge um, I started out with I'm a native Californian so I thought aha I don't even have to take a plane to come to Hollywood I'm here they don't even have to fly me out to discover me they don't have to go to Ohio or Iowa here I am well I realized that that was definitely wrong um, I had to work harder than anybody. Um, I grew up across the street from MGM, um, the studio in Culver City, which is where I filmed Dallas for 11 years. Um, so my parents said, um, you know, in actuality, you haven't gotten very far in life. I'm still in Culver City. <laughs> so that was kind of a, that's what been always kind of a family inside joke. But I started out as a model. I, I went to an all-girls Catholic school, and I had done a little bit of uh, theater in high school and uh, in college. And somebody saw a photograph of me. I'm making this a uh, long story, very short, so that we can get to the, the core, the essence of, of what uh, I'm here to talk about. And so I started out modeling. And deep within me, I knew that I wanted to be an actress, but I came from a very, very strict Catholic background and that was not acceptable I could be a nurse a secretary an airline hostess things like that that were acceptable but I wanted to be an actress so I figured that through modeling I could kind of sneak in the back door and modeling was somehow acceptable uh, I remember my grandmother and my mother saying well you know what they say about actresses so that had that stigma at that particular time when I was growing up. Society did not embrace that particular uh, calling in life. So I started modeling. And then I wanted to do commercials. And they would pat me on the head, not literally, but figuratively. And they'd say, uh, oh, well, models can't act. And that's when inwardly, and now it's very verbal, um, I created two words that have fit into my life that I would like to share because they've become um, key, the kind of buzzwords for me. And that whenever somebody says, oh, you can't do that, I say, here they are, watch me. So those two words for me, with a smile, <laughs> not angry, not arrogant, not, you know, not with an attitude, I just smile sweetly and I say, watch me. So those two words have been incredibly powerful words. I didn't know it at the time. But when somebody said to me, oh, models can't act, darling. Watch me. That has become almost a kind of a, kind of a mantra for me. Uh, and then I did commercials, but I was still visual. Uh, commercially, I was visual. Then, uh, I, you know, as a model, I was a visual. I was a pretty face. And when I did commercials, they hired me because I looked like a California girl. And then I said, but excuse me, I would like to speak. And they go, oh, no, darling, no, no. <laughs> and I'd say, oh, watch me. <laughs> right? And so then I got to speak. One line, two lines, four little words. And then I said, you know, this is wonderful, and I've done it. I've done it well, and I'd like to become a spokeswoman. And they went, oh, can't do that. Well, watch me became now all of a sudden very, very prominent in my vocabulary. And I said, well, I really would like to do that. So I started doing that. And I got married. I had children. I worked long before. I've been working ever since I was 17 at my craft. Uh, it was slow. Um, I, I, I got married, as I said. I had two children. Worked all the way through pregnancies, sitting on a stool from here up, looking adorable. From here down, I was a little round. So the children have always had a work working mother. And I continued to do commercials because it was lucrative. I could be home with the children. And then the desire inside of me to do something better, something more, something more challenging, uh, was very loud. And um, 
I said to my husband one night, I said, I, you know, I really want to become an actress. And he laughs about this to this day, but he said, you know, why don't you become an actress when the children are in college? And I went, oh, <laughs> it was a big thud. And I said, well, you know, but I'll be a character actress by then. I don't want to do that. I want to do it now. And he said, no, 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 darling. And the famous two words came up again, and I thought, that was quiet that time. <laughs> I thought, okay, I have to do what's important to me. I really have to do this without, uh, without destroying the family, without doing anything else. I had to do what I had to do. That little seed was germinating, and I had to do it. So I enrolled when the children were in school, and they were, they were small. I enrolled in a, in a workshop. And everyone else was off, uh, you know, doing their, they would come to workshop and then go off to, to work. And I'd go home and pay the babysitter and be mommy. So I was always, um, I was kind of out of sync with society. They, they were 18 years old. I was, uh, I was in my 30s. When this but you happened. were training. I you was training, training absolutely. Yeah. I was working and honing it. And I found the workshop to be invaluable in that I was trained in front of the camera. I was trained here, hand motions very slow, so I knew what to do in, in an ECU, an extreme close-up. I knew what to do. I knew you couldn't flip around and do mad, wild, fast gestures. I learned all the camera angles, all the lenses. I knew that there were planes flying over that you had to kind of work around. Um, I learned all those things that are important to filmmaking. Why don't we take a little break while the plane flies over. Good idea. And we come back. Good idea. <clears throat> I think the rest is, is a bit of history uh, in television in that I played Sue Ellen Ewing for 11 years on Dallas. After this sort of ongoing process of uh, the struggle continues and it, was, it wasn't a struggle, it was a love struggle. It was like that's what I knew I wanted to do. And then there came another point where I had done Sue Ellen and I had done her well and I wanted to move on and I wanted to direct and uh, that that was a struggle in itself uh, an again another um, another challenge in life that's the way I look at it so I uh, went uh, approached our producers and said I would like to direct well that we, I was given a no and again pursued it and I was given the opportunity um, you were very instrumental in that, by the way. Uh, Thank you. Studying with you was, um, and the people must know that, it was very instrumental in giving me the confidence, the inner confidence, the confidence of, of a woman out there having proven herself in one particular area, moving into another area. So you were very, very instrumental in it, and I need everyone to know, the audience especially, that it's very, very wonderful uh, to have someone who's gently pushing you with love, encouraging you from behind, saying, yes, you can do it, yes, you can do it, and I'm here in case you fall. That, that nurturing was very important to me. And um, so I applaud you on film for that. You were invaluable to me, and you still are. So when the, the day came for me to direct, I was a nervous wreck. And you had prepared me uh, I mean, we had gone over the script with a fine tooth comb. And, when, and as long as I'm talking about preparation, that is the ultimate. Uh, whether you're an actress, whether you're a stagehand, a costume, or makeup artist, whatever you are in the industry, we are all a unit. We're a whole that make that particular vehicle, that, that movie, that, uh, the script, whatever, makes it important. We make it, um, it's a gift. We're given, we, ent we are entertaining, and it's a gift that we've been given that we give fully to an audience. Um, if you're not prepared, then it, then it means nothing, because when you work with a bunch of wonderfully dedicated, wonderfully prepared, energetic, enthusiastic people, uh, the people that are not prepared rise and they, they, they shot up there. They're like the, uh, the poppy in the field, you know, they, they, kind of, uh, they kind of show. So you must be prepared and you must really lovingly do your job and do it with a great deal of style, dignity, class, and preparation. Those, that's, those, are, those are the ultimate things that you have to, uh, you have to attain in your craft. Um, when I was directing, I had incredible respect for each craft that I not, not had I taken it for granted, but 
I wasn't so aware of the, of the sound. I was just, as an actress, I'd say, oh, there's a plane, there's a bird, there's a dog barking, a child crying. But when you're getting a wonderful performance from somebody and you have to cut the camera because the noise is an interference, that it jars you and you have great respect for those sound people that you, uh, you only know from an actress standpoint. So I had a blanket umbrella respect for every single craft. Everybody was invaluable to that particular segment, even though it was a small segment, wasn't a film, it's television, it was quality. I felt very good about what I had done. I was prepared. You had made sure I was. <laughs> but I did my homework, and I did it well, and I was proud. I was proud of myself. And I've done six, uh, six episodes in all, prepared. That, my homework was the key and a smile and be, be um, aware that it can, something can change at any moment. You know, somebody may get sick with it. This wardrobe may have not made it to location. So you have to have a bit of sense, as, as a great deal of sense of humor and kind of let it show. I mean, you have to like laugh and giggle and, you know, go with the flow of that particular production. Speaking of productions, um, when, I, when I finished doing uh, Sue Ellen and the directing, which I'm not finished with, but uh, that that chapter is uh, complete. Um, I thought, you know, it would really be interesting to create something from the ground up. I would like to buy a project that I can be in control of, not from a control standpoint, but from a loving place of of control. Um, from watch me. From watch me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, but I really wanted to um, to purchase a project that I could be in charge of from the ground up, and take it and make something magical. It was to me. It was like gardening. It take a little seed, put it in the ground, pat it with a little earth, give it some water, a lot of love, and watch it grow. And you have a beautiful flower. You bring it in the house. You say, look what I did. I have that with my two children, you know, I'm constantly amazed that uh, these wondrous children, uh, you know, are walking around as a product of, uh, of what we created. So that's how I look at it, it's an ongoing life process. So when I bought these few projects, um, it was, a, it was an exciting time for me because all of a sudden I looked back at the little kid from Culver City who started out as a model, then did commercials, then w lucky enough to... Uh, become Sue Ellen Ewing for many years, directed, now I'm going to produce. And I look back with kind of a, kind of a giggle, it's like, God, look, not only watch me, but look what I've done, it's great. And I'm excited, I'm thrilled, and I really encourage the, the youth out there, our next generation, to never give up your dream, to, to keep all that love and the energy and and the stick to it that you, that you have in the very beginning, don't let anyone dissuade you. And don't get all caught up in the fact that you didn't get this interview or you failed. That word should never creep into your vocabulary. The word is, it's an ongoing process. And it's, there's, a, there's a famous book that I, that's one of my favorites. It's called Don't Push the River. There's a wonderful word called patience. It's a great word called love. Um, and there's, there's a great deal of dignity that you, you derive from sticking to your goals, uh, keeping to your dreams, and you know, be careful what you dream because they could come true. And in my case, they have. But don't let anybody tell you that it can't be done. Uh, stay to it, be prepared. Uh, don't get disappointed, too disappointed, um, because there have been many, many times when I've been rejected. And if you look at it as a whole, our industry rejects people all the time. Most people go through life and they're fired from a job once or twice in their lifetime. With us, we're rejected daily, maybe five, six times a day. All it does is layer you and layer you and you come back and you say, here I am again. And you smile and you say, watch me. And you don't give up. And you, don't, you do expect, but you have to be prepared so that I, that expectation, when that, when that seed does happen, that you can go ahead and be the best you can be. Um, would you say that very often the young people expect too much too soon? And this is what happens when they come in this town and suddenly nothing happens within the first 24 hours. 
um, they think that what they read in newspapers, the drugs and the, the carrying on is the way to go. Um, I think it's a life exp I think what happens in life is that we all want it to happen tomorrow, no matter what we're doing. Um, I think with the drugs, you can't act with drugs. It doesn't work. Uh, you have to be totally prepared, totally on your mark, totally on your target. Don't expect too much, but at, on the, in the same token, expect everything. Thank you, Linda, very much for sharing with us. It's a pleasure. I could talk forever and ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Linda. Earlier, I told you we would talk about the opportunities in Hollywood for jobs gained or missed. And let me explain to you. This week in the TV Guide, there was an article written um, about actors who lie and get away with it and sometimes get away with and actors who do lie and their life become an absolute disaster. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say that, and remember that I use the word actor for both male and female. Let's say that you, the actor, write on your resume that you have done a certain character in a play and you name the play and you name the character. Now, a casting director is talking to you and asks you about another character in the play. Now, if you cannot answer intelligently, the casting director knows that you lied. Now, it's not so much the fact that you lied, it's the fact that you did not open the book and therefore acquired some knowledge about the play and the character. They don't like that. Um, then they may not give you the role because they think that you did not act professionally and you were not interested enough to read the play. Another lie which then could be much more dangerous is Let's say that you're up for a role and you're very good and you could do it very well. However, getting the role hinges on you being able to do some kind of a sport, um, high jump, ride a horse, scuba diving, water ski. You want the role so badly, you're hungry, you taste it, you lie. You say, I was champion in high school, I was champion in college. You audition, you get the role, Lo and behold, you're going to do it. It's your first break. Well, it could also be your last, because you could break your neck. And in doing so, you could endanger not only your life, but the life of the other people around you. That is not what acting professionally is all about. Now, if you write on your resume that you can do a certain skill or a certain sport, at least take classes in those sports. Or practice them. It won't cost you anything but practice. Do not go and lie on something that could endanger your life. Next, uh, in one of our next following statement, uh, segment, we will introduce you to a couple of people who started as actors and segue into stunt people, a man and a woman who are now at the top of their professions and who then became stunt coordinators. Um, that will be all for today. Remember, keep watching us because we will keep watching out for you. Thank you. Goodbye.